Next presenter, Dr. Bernal with cardiac arrest in pregnancy. All right. Hello, my name is uh, Jorge Alejandro Bernal. I am an internal medicine resident, uh, PGY2. Uh, I am in DHR, UTRGV down in Edinburgh, Texas, so really south uh, point of, the, of Texas. All right, well, I'm gonna be presenting a case that we had uh, of cardiac arrest in a, a patient with pregnancy. And I think. All right, so we began with a patient that came in on New Year's Eve around 9 p.m. She was a 28-year-old lady with a past medical history of uh, no significant past medical history, 23 weeks of gestation. Uh, initially, she presented to the woman's hospital. She, uh, uh, she was transferred over to the emergency department with uh, right flank pain, uh, day-long fever. Upon the emergency department uh, evaluation, a physician noted that she, was, uh, she had chills, hypotensive, and fever. Of course, the labs showed leukocytosis, lactic acidosis. The UA had uh, two plus blood, one plus protein. Uh, leukocytes consistent with a UTI. Uh, the assessment of plan at that time was uh, to treat for uh, Q-Pylo. Uh, she had some uh, fluid resuscitation, uh, was pan cultured, and uh, given empiric uh, antibiotics. And then we, uh, they consulted over to OBGYN. <clears throat> uh, upon the OBGYN evaluation, they noticed that she did respond to fluid resuscitation uh, with improvement of lactic acidosis and the blood pressure. E evaluated the fetus uh, with a fetal monitor uh, placed, and they were kept on board for any uh, acute events. Around 10 p.m., the emergency department was uh, updated that the, the fetus was uh, noted to be in distress. Uh, she had new onset of chest pain, shortness of breath, uh, no crackles or wheezes on the physical exam. Uh, she had a, a, a troponin, BMP, and CBCs were collected, which the troponin initially was at 0 0.37. Uh, down training, hemoglobin and platelets, uh, ECG, and a chest X-ray, unremarkable at that point. And then the critical care team was uh, notified um, and she was transferred to ICU, but due to the overflow from uh, ICU, she went to step down. All right, so shortly after being transported, uh, uh, almost <laughs> going into the, to the step down unit, uh, she was noted to be in respiratory distress, tachymneic, uh, with uh, excess use of respiratory muscles, uh, saturating around 85-90% uh, on a number of breathing mass. She was noted to be uh, hypertensive with uh, systolics of 220 and heart rates of 150s. A levator push was uh, given, which showed uh, improvement. Um, but the fetal monitor was noted to be uh, still in fetal distress with variable decelerations and Brady. Uh, the, there was a prompt notification to a neonatologist and OBGYN who were new to, to that center at the time. Uh, uh, but we had you know get the full team to get on board with a possible C-section. Uh, due to impending respiratory uh, failure, we had to uh, protect her airways with emergent uh, intubation. We placed her in analgesia and sedation, uh, intubated, and uh, upon evaluation, uh, we saw as a Cormac Lee Hain, uh, class two view of the glottis, some aspiration and edema. Shortly after the, imp uh, the intubation, she was noted to be hypotensive, uh, and then the, the fetal heart tones were also lost. So she went into PA arrest around 11 p.m., uh, stat labs were ordered. Uh, before initiating chest compressions, we did a leftward uh, displacement of the uterus, initiated chest compressions, uh, and then the OBGYN and the neonatologist were on board um, for emergency section. Uh, the uh, eyes and nose, uh, I'm sorry, so we, we tried to, to do a central line, uh, I mean, due to chest compressions, we couldn't go on the right IJ. Due to the C-section that was being prepared, uh, we couldn't go uh, femoral, so we did an IO at that time. And then uh, uh, the ROS was achieved around 10 minutes, and we followed up with the POCUS evaluation. So this is uh, the, the imaging that we saw at that moment. Of course, the EKG was pretty much all remarkable. The chest X-ray uh, completely whited out. And then this is the, uh, actually this is the TTE, uh, which showed uh, the uh, cardiologist's estimation of 10%. All right, so at this moment, we're thinking, you know, uh, uh, what are the differentials for a patient? Why did she go into uh, cardiac arrest? 
So certainly, you know, we go through differentials. Hypovolemic uh, was maybe increased uh, urine frequency, low PO uh, fluids, maybe in the setting of the, uh, UTI, but with our POCUS evaluation, we noticed that IVC was actually dilated. Uh, hemorrhagic uh, patients, you, you know, in pregnancy, we're worried about uh, abruption or retroperitoneal uh, uh, hematomas. Again, the, the POCUS was very helpful at that moment, and there was uh, no uh, fluid on the uh, Morrison's pouch, and the fetus was present in the, uh, in the uterus. And then there was no overt signs of bleeding, no vaginal bleeding. Obstruction, you know, that's always uh, a huge part that we wanna, don't want to miss, tamponade, PE, pneumothorax. Again, the POCUS is helpful in the M mode, not showing any pneumothorax, uh, and then uh, no pericardial effusions or right ventricular stain, strain, sorry. <clears throat> And distributive, uh, sepsis is still in within our differ, uh, differentiation, differentials. Uh, so again, the IVC shows dilated, she did receive the appropriate amount of, of fluids within time, uh, but it's still within our, our differentials. The only thing that we uh, uh, were limited to was uh, cardiogenic. Uh, so, I mean, there's many possibilities that we cannot rule out at the moment. Uh, the, the, with the ejection fraction did show the 10% uh, of the, sorry, the focus did show around 10% uh, ejection fraction. Uh, and then the formal echo that would later would uh, confirm it. And our, our difference at this time was a spontaneous coronary artery dissection, an MI, pericardial, uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy, or Takotsubo. Uh, unfortunately, she didn't give us much time to you know, fully think out through our process because she went into PA arrest shortly. Uh, this is her second time, uh, and an emergency section was, you know, was still going on at this moment. We, she got a ROSC at four minutes. And then shortly after, she went again into a PEA arrest. Uh, and then at this moment, she was, uh, the C-section the C was already completed. Uh, but the, she, unfortunately, she had fetal demise around 11.32. And then, again, she went into PEA arrest back and forth. Uh, for a total of six times. Uh, finally, she came, uh, she came out of, uh, of the PA arrest at around, around 11.58 p.m., a uh, ROSC of six minutes. A combined downtime of 30 minutes was estimated. In the labs, after the cardiac arrest, uh, she had lactic acidosis, uh, troponins at 4.68, hypomagnesemia with no hemolysis or thrombocytopenia. On the ABG, there was respiratory, uh, uh, and uh, an ion gap metabolic acidosis with a PF ratio of 33. Uh, she, again, she was placed in, uh, continued with a broad spectrum antibiotics, vasopressors, and a bicarb drip. And there was a decision to prone her at that time, given the, the presentation. Uh, we did uh, consult the cardiologist, and the cardiologist uh, you know, basically recommended strong recommendation for an ECMO, but d due to our uh, limitations in our institution, we don't have an ECMO. We did contact uh, the advanced heart failure team here in Houston for any transport, and we do have those capabilities to transport patients. Uh, but she was deemed too unstable at that moment. We were worried for any further decompensation for during the transportation. The total critical care time was uh, around <laughs> more of, above uh, four hours. So. Uh, so it wasn't until about 4 a.m. that we started noticing that she uh, was having some improvements. Uh, her maps began to increase. She came off the, the pressors. Uh, the repeat focus with the cardiologist at, at bedside estimated the ejection fraction of 25%, and the ABG started showing uh, a resolution of the uh, anion gap metabolic acidosis and a respiratory, only showing respiratory acidosis with a PF ratio of 115. Um, so the next couple of days, uh, she began following commands on the extubation trials. Uh, she was able to be extubated around uh, 10 days after the event, and uh, she was discharged around 20 days with no neurofocal uh, deficits. The diagnosis uh, that we um, you know, uh, thought of the patient uh, is car de cardiac decompensation in the setting of septic shock and uh, metabolic derangements. So I just wanted to show the uh, initial um, TTE. And then this was the uh, uh, four-chamber apical, uh, apical view, because this is the, the best one that I can find. You can see the improved ejection fraction. This was basically the, the, the second one that we had to follow up. All right, so uh, some takeaway home points, and uh, certainly a learning point for me on this case, uh, that there's some, no we have to keep in mind that there's some notable changes in, uh, in the pregnancy. Uh, 
such as uh, that can affect our, the physiology and, and uh, our approach to the patient in this acute situation. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, the normal physiology changes. Again, the increased uh, circular, uh, uh, circulating volume, which uh, comes into play the cardiac output, stroke volume, heart uh, rate, uh, respiratory rate, and O2 consumption, and also a decrease in total lung capacity and lung compliance. Again, this all affects our, our air, the way we're going to manage our airway, breathing, and circulation. In the airway, uh, you know, you, there's changes in the airway just to a normal anatomy uh, changes. Uh, respiratory, the way we manage the, the mechanical ventilations. Uh, uh, and then uh, circulation as well, your shock parameters are a little bit different on patients that, that are uh, pregnant. And then also uh, to keep in mind that, you know, she does have a baby and we want to take care of that baby as well. Uh, and uh, you have to have good fetal monitoring and, and a lot of uh, other specialists as well working together. So um, I guess if I can summarize the, the points, it would be the uh, anticipate a difficult airway when you're gonna be intubating a patient like this. Uh, the uh, good chest compressions, which include the, la the left uh, displacement of the uterus. And this is, uh, this is considered around 20 weeks of gestation, but uh, Around uh, 24 weeks, you, it's uh, completely uh, indicated. And then also, uh, the fetal monitors need to be removed when you're gonna start defibrillating the patient. And consider a C-section after four minutes if the patient is not successfully uh, ROS achieved. All right, so references. All right. Thank you. We were going to say, in the sake of time, fantastic presentation. Thank I you. wanted to make sure that Dr. Go also had an audience before everybody catches their sure. plane. Does anybody have any comments? Uh, just a rapid one. I mean, I think you're very lucky uh, <laughs> in having a very good outcome at the end. I think that if you repeat it 100 times, you will fail probably much more than you will succeed. Um, probably one of the key elements was that initially, if I understood well, there was no anatomic support or whatever just after the echo. Uh, and you begin to do this, sepsis is indeed usually um, responding quite well to small anthropic doses, so that's why the patient probably improved at some point. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, I mean that uh, when you see the echo and when you see the blood gas or whatever, I think repeating this, you will fail a lot of time. For uh, just a logistical aspect, you will indeed not be able to insert the ECMO, but probably inserting the ECMO at that time for gaining time would have been something to consider in many other occasions. The patient left the hospital after a 20-day hospitalization with a severely impaired LV systolic function, is that correct? Uh, actually, no, she recovered quite well and she, we still see her at the clinic. I thought you said the last uh, echo showed an EF of 25%. Oh, that, that was, was shortly mistaken? after, sorry, I don't know if I made that clear. Uh, it's shortly after the you know, resuscitation, so maybe about a day or two. <clears throat> 24 hours. Well, I'm just curious about the, the ultimate diagnosis of, of mm -hmm. you know, sepsis, and we would expect that to be a reversible process. So mm -hmm. I, I would have expected her, at least her myocardium, if that was a diagnosis, to have fully recovered. So I'd be interested to see what that actually was. Right. Uh, and I mean, at that time, so many things were going on with this patient, and you know, I'm pretty sure there were a lot of things just flew past by us. Um, but, you know, um, we did everything we can within our, within our possibilities that we have in our institution. So for clarification, how was the last uh, echocardiogram, how was the last uh, uh, evaluation that we have for the left ventricular structure and function? So actually it's completely normal. This is, yeah, and, and we've, again, we're following up the patient. She's completely healthy. Um, I, I mean, she lost her baby, that's the only thing. And, and you know, she's, she's following up and dealing with those changes. But as far as cardiac-wise, then she's doing fine. So she didn't have any family history of prior comorbidities? No, not that we are aware of. And I mean, of course, follow-up evaluations, nothing has come up yet. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. You.